Okay, welcome to the Reading Without Walls panel, a conversation with Jean Luen Yang. My name is Johanna Draper Carlson. I run comicsworthreading.com, the longest running independent review site online that covers all formats and genres of comics. And I'm very honored to be here today to talk with Jean. Uh, we'll start with a brief introduction to his work. Of course, he is probably best known for American born Chinese, uh, which, sorry which was the first graphic novel to be a finalist for the National Book Award for Young People's Literature and an Eisner Award winner. Uh, I also wanted to put up, because it's a fond one of mine, uh, the first book he did, uh, Animal Crackers reprints Gordon Yamamoto and the King of the Geeks, because that's a great title. And that book did win a Zerich grant as well. A uh, sample page from American Born Chinese demonstrating his use of the Monkey King and Chinese folklore. Also, Boxers and Saints, a story told in parallel during the Boxer Rebellion, the tale of a Chinese peasant boy who joins a violent uprising against Western interlopers, and the story of a girl taken in by, Chinese, by Christian missionaries. Currently, Jean is writing both New Superman, 15 issues so far, in a, with a technology-based Justice League version set in China, and Secret Coders, the fourth volume of which comes out next month with a fifth volume next spring, which teaches the basics of computer programming through children investigating a mysterious puzzles at a secretive school and has great binary eyed birds. Jean was named the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature last year in a two year position. He is also the 2016 recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship or Genius Grant, the third graphic novelist to receive that honor after Ben Ketchor and Alison Bechdel. Here's a photo from the ceremony. And with the former ambassadors, Kate DiCamillo and John Cieza? Jessica. Jessica, thank you. And the initiative is Reading Without Walls, a challenge to encourage teachers and students to explore books with diverse voices, genres, and formats. Um, there have been a number of excellent material to encourage some reading suggestions. And I believe we have some posters outside as well after the panel. So, Jean, what does it mean to be the National Ambassador for Young People's Literature? <laughs> well, first, thank you all so much for being here. It really is uh, an honor and a pleasure to, to get a chance to talk to you all. National Ambassador for Young People's Literature is it's the fanciest job title I've ever had. It's the most syllables. I'm super excited about it. Uh, the, the position is not super old. It got started in 2008. Every ambassador has a two-year term. That's why I'm only the fifth one. Uh, and the whole point is to both get more kids reading and kids reading more. So I'm the first uh, graphic novelist, although the, my immediate predecessor, Kate DiCamillo, have you all read her books? She did uh, Because of Win dixie I bet you've read her book. <laughs> she, uh, her, one of her most recent books is called uh, Flora and Ulysses, and it's actually hybrid. So it's half comics and, and half prose. Lovely book. So I'm not the only National Ambassador to have ever written comics. Every National Ambassador picks uh, a platform, so something they want to focus on. And for me, it's reading without walls, which means I'm trying to get kids to read outside of their comfort zones, to read books that they wouldn't normally pick up. Do you want to elaborate on how so? Sure, sure. Uh, I've been going around the country uh, doing speaking engagements, mm -hmm. and I've been issuing what's called the Reading Without Walls Challenge. So the way the challenge works is this. You can either do this as an individual or you can do this as a, a community. You just set a due date for yourself. And by the end of that due date, you do one of three things. Number one, you read a book about somebody who is very different from you, who doesn't look like you or live like you. Somebody who, at least on the surface, seems like someone you wouldn't hang out with. Two, you read a book about a topic that you might not know anything about or you might even find intimidating. Or three, you read a book in a format that you don't normally read for fun. So if normally all you read are, are prose books or chapter books, I want you to try a graphic novel. If normally all you read are comics, I want you to try something with no pictures in it or a collection of poetry or even an audio book. And if you really want to go for the gold, then you uh, try to pick a book where all three of those criteria are true. We've been stunned. You know, uh, the, the Library of Congress and uh, another organization called Every Child a Reader and another one called Children's Book Council, they're sort of the sponsors of the ambassador position. Um, we get all sorts of feedback from teachers and librarians and, and bookstore owners uh, who have run this program with 
their communities, and it's been wonderful. We've we've gotten like photos of these elaborate wall displays, and some even turned the initiative into a like a bingo game, <laughs> which I thought was amazingly creative. Um, there's an amazing bookstore in in uh, Portland that set up these Reading Without Walls shelves, where they would suggest books that might fit one of those criteria for their patrons. It's been awesome. Excellent. Now it occurs to me the first part of that challenge, read a book about someone not like you, is something that children of color are mostly doing already. Yes. yes. So, um, so that that's actually one of the I, one of the very valid critiques of um, of the program is that there are kids in America where they're just constantly reading books about people who aren't like them at all, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, and I have to say that one of my um, one of my goals with the Reading Without Walls challenge is to try to up the circulation of books that normally wouldn't get circulated. So my hope is, uh, for, for those kids, I think maybe, maybe the other two ch challenges are, are, mm -hmm, are more appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm also hoping to serve those kids by upping the circulation uh, and the demand for books that feature characters that are actually like them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have any good stories about anybody you met or anything you did while traveling around? Well, you know, my favorite interactions, and it's because I'm a comic book nerd, but my favorite interactions are always with young comic book nerds, specifically young aspiring cartoonists. You know, mm -hmm. almost everywhere I go, every school I visit or every, every library I visit, um, at least one kid will bring a sketchbook up to me and I'll get to see what they're working on. So just recently, uh, over the summer, I went to this book festival and there was this, uh, this one girl, she's very shy, and she brought up her, her sketchbook to me. As I was flipping through it, she made shy kid noises, which were noises that I made when I was a kid. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, and, and she barely said a word, mm -hmm. but then after I handed the book back to her, um, she comes up to me and she whispers, I look forward to working next to you in our chosen profession, which I thought was awesome. Oh, awesome. I, I, also, I also look forward to working next to her in our chosen profession. Well, so that brings up the question of um, how and why did you start making comics? I started making comics when I was in the fifth grade. So I started drawing when I was really young. I started drawing. My mom tells me I started drawing when I was two years old. And I bet that's, like, that's a really common story here, right? Almost all of us started drawing before we could remember. Um, but, uh, but I, really, I really didn't discover comics until the fifth grade. Before that, I was interested in telling stories through drawing. But my only awareness of that was animation. You know, I would watch cartoons on TV. I loved Disney. I loved watching Disney cartoons. Uh, so my lifelong ambition when I was in early elementary school was to grow up and work for Disney. I wanted to be a Disney animator. Then in fifth grade, my mom took me to our local bookstore. I saw an issue of... Marvel 2-in-1 starring The Thing and Ron the Space Knight. As soon as I saw that, I felt like I, I just needed to own it. I was magnetically drawn to that cover. My mom wouldn't let me buy it, though, because she thought that Ron the Space Knight and The Thing looked way too scary. So she bought me the Superman comic instead. Uh, and I brought that Superman comic home, and I read it, and that book just blew my mind. I mean, it was about the atomic bomb. It was, it was Superman teamed up with the Atomic Knights. The, mm -hmm. the, the bomb drops and it kills off almost everybody on the planet. They have this adventure. It turns out to be an imaginary story, but it's still, it was like a mind-blowing story for me when I was in fifth grade. And after that, I started making comics. Mm -hmm. I had a, a best friend named Jeremy Kunyoshi in fifth grade, half Jewish, half Japanese. Uh, we were, you know, we were, we, were, we were not good at tetherball. So when our friends were playing tetherball, we would sit at the lunch tables and we would make up stories. And then we would draw comics. Uh, his mom would take him to work his mom was super supportive of us. She would take, a, take him to work and, and she'd um, photocopy our comics for us and we would staple them and we sold them for 50 cents a piece. We made $8. It was glorious. It was <laughs> yeah. That's how I got started. That was my, that was my start in, in comics. Why did you keep with it? Yeah, I mean, Jeremy didn't. You know, Jeremy, yeah. he's, a, he's a radiologist now, <laughs> which, which honestly, financially speaking, is a much better choice. <laughs> he lives in this beautiful house in Hawaii. It's awesome. But I kept, I kept making comics. I think, um, I don't know. I, 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 think, uh, I think there's something, I think there's something about storytelling that just, especially storytelling through comics, that would, li would not let me go. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I felt... I felt compelled to do it um, all the way through junior high. And then in high school, I did stop. 
in high school, I did stop collecting comics for a little bit. Uh, and I stopped because um, a friend told me that I couldn't get a girlfriend if I kept reading comics. <laughs> and I was like, I want a girlfriend, so I'm going to you. He's totally wrong. He's totally wrong. I stopped for a little bit, and I started collecting comics again. And after I started collecting comics again, that's when I got my first girlfriend. So he was, he was just lying. He was just filling my head with lies. Um, but uh, but I, I think, um, you know, there's, there's this advice that uh, young writers sometimes get where if you can do anything else besides write, you should just go do that other thing because writing is just going to lead you to all sorts of heartache. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's a truth, there's a kernel of truth in that statement in that a lot of us who are in comics, uh, a lot of us who are in storytelling, the storytelling arts, we're here because there's just something about it that we can't let go of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did you come to be selected as the ambassador? Dude, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a black box sort of thing, right? Uh, although, although I get to have a hand in selecting the next one, so if you ask me this in a month, I'll have oh. I'll, I'll, I'll have a better idea. But it's, okay. it was it was this crazy thing. I was on book tour uh, in October of 2015. I get this call from my editor at First Second Books. He goes, "This is going to happen." He told me about the national ambassadorship, and he says, "He's like they haven't announced it. They're not going to announce it until January. You can't tell anybody." So I was actually in uh, in a car with an author escort. So this is the thing. I didn't know that this was a thing until I started doing book tours. But they have. These, mm -hmm. these folks whose job it is to, uh, to, to drive you around, which is super nice. But I couldn't show any emotion, right? Because <laughs> I was with, with an author at school. I couldn't show any emotion, so I just had to keep it to myself. And then uh, after I got to my hotel, I called my wife, and, and we all freaked out a little bit about it. But it's crazy. Before that, like, I was aware of the National Ambassador Program because I'm a huge fan of Katie Camillo, my immediate predecessor. Um, so I would follow, I would see her stuff. You know, see what she was doing as as ambassador from time to time online. Mm -hmm. But I never, I never thought that that would be a thing that could happen to me. I mean, it, maybe, maybe in part because I'm a graphic novelist, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, um, I think in a lot of ways, my career has um, benefited from the world of books and the world of comics coming together. I, I think my career kind of it. I started, I started in the industry at right around the right time. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, benefit is not, it's not a strong enough word. I feel like my entire career is built on that collision. Yeah, you, you, together. you do seem to have done a, a book that makes very strong statements about diversity and accepting yourself at a time when people were hungry for that kind of material. You were one of the few New York Times cartoonists during a time when they were doing that, and you got Prime Baby out of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, kind I've of been really lucky. I've been crazy <laughs> lucky, you know. I've been like shocking. Uh, the the amount of the amount of fortune I've had has been has been shocking. Yeah, and and also think like, like the the, the fact that um, you know, American Born Chinese was the was the first graphic novel to have been nominated for a National Book Award. The reason why the National Book Award Committee even considered a graphic novel at the time. It was a it was a conscious decision to like you know they, they talked about how they wanted to make a conscious decision to broaden the the kinds of formats that they were going to consider. The reason why they even had that thought was because of you know Linda Berry and Art Spiegelman and the Hernandez brothers and, and Craig Thompson. All those books came out mm -hmm. um, at, at a time where people didn't have a category for non superhero comics for literary comics. So. So all those works over the course of several decades built this, this space in people's minds for non-superhero comics to exist. And then, you know, I put out American War Chinese in 2006. I'm a huge beneficiary of all of the work that all those cartoonists had done. Before. Yeah, uh, you know, the Mouse had a huge breakthrough yes. decades ago. Yes. But there was nothing for people to read next. Yeah. But with your book coming out, what, what would you recommend for someone who loved American Born Chinese? Oh man, there's so much stuff out right now, right? Mm -hmm. the, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean uh, I'm a huge fan of Jillian Tamaki who was sitting right here uh, <laughs> an hour ago. 15 minutes yeah. ago. <laughs> and and her, her the book that she did with Mariko Tam Tamaki this one summer, I think is is absolutely amazing. Uh, I love anything by Ben Hackey, who does Zeta the Space Girl and Raina Telgemeier stuff. Is absolutely awesome. March, March, the third volume of March is the first graphic novel to have won a National Book Award. And when you read that book, you'll get why. You'll understand why. It's uh, it's absolutely uh, stunning. It's just, I, I kind of feel like in American comics, at least in American graphic novels, we are in the middle of 
a, a, almost like a renaissance where mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. of the, the greatest books told in this form are being produced right now as we speak. I mean, they're being produced, like they're being sold up upstairs, right? Mm -hmm. Many of the mm -hmm. best things that America has ever produced. Yeah. So as ambassador, as a graphic novelist, did you find yourself having to explain the format or being treated differently? Um, I, I, again, I, I, th I think that I, I was a huge beneficiary of a lot of the work that had happened before I came along, right? So I do every now and then, you know, especially earlier in my career, I would meet uh, librarians and teachers and parents who struggled with the literary merits of comics. But those folks have become fewer and fewer. It could be that they just know who I am and they don't want to talk to me anymore, right? <laughs> but it does seem like, it does seem like if you go to any graphic, like when I was a kid, um, you know, hanging out with Jeremy, Jeremy took me to my first comic book shop. And the way we got to that comic book shop was, he had this trick. We would get our parents to drop us off at our local library then they would drive home. Back then, you, if you were a parent, you could let your kids go at the library, right? You wouldn't do that now. But, but, um, but they would drive home, and we would wait till they drove home, and then we would sneak out of that library. We'd walk 20 minutes to the comic book shop. We'd oh. buy as many comics as we could out of the quarter bin. We'd take them back to the library, and then we would uh, you know, um, check out these big coffee table books. <laughs> you know, these big, these big books to hide our comics in when we take them home. And be like, I had no idea you were into Egyptology. <laughs> <laughs> right? that's, that's how we had to get comics. Mm -hmm. Now, my local library has a better graphic novel section than my local comic book store. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. it's stunning. It's, abs it's, a, it's a night and day world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we are living in the future we dreamed about. Yes, yes. yes. that we never thought so. would actually come about. Yeah. yeah. So what have you read for the Reading Without Walls Challenge? Well, the, the most recent book that I read um, was called uh, Bronx Masquerade. It's by Nikki Grimes, uh, multiple award-winning uh, uh, novelist. It's a, it's a collection. It's, a, it's like a novel told in verse. It's actually, the, the premise is it's a collection of poetry written by students in a school in the Bronx. And as you read through each kid's poem, it actually gives you a narrative of what's going on during the school year. It's really a, a, mm -hmm. a brilliant book. Um, and and uh, I, I feel like that book, at least for me, hits all three of the different criteria, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the, kids, the kids have a, a very different background from me, uh, not, just, not just culturally, but also socioeconomically. It's uh, about, like the, the book itself, is not just told in poetry, it is also about poetry. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I really know nothing about. And then, and then the format is not something I would normally read for fun. Although I gotta say, I'm reading more and more like narrative poetry. There, there's another book called um, The Crossover mm -hmm. by Kwame Alexander, it won the Newbery Award, it's amazing. If you want, it's a, it's a book about <coughs> basketball. And if you wanna read a good sports book, that is a great sports book. It struck me, um, reading American Born Chinese, that that is somewhat of a challenging structure. And I think we've, we've talked a little bit about um, not talking down to kids, how smart you think kids are. Can you address that a little bit in terms of work, creating work for young readers? Yeah, I, I think, um, well first, when I did American Born Chinese, I did it as mini comics. So I would finish mm -hmm. a chapter, and then I would Xerox it. I'd make maybe 50 copies, I'd take it to Ape, I, I didn't come to SPX until very recently, but mm -hmm. Ape is a show that's like SPX on the West Coast. And I'd sell maybe, I don't know, a dozen copies over the course of a weekend. I knew most of the people I sold it to. It would be like 11 of my friends and my mom. You know? <laughs> um, so when you're working on that scale, you don't think about, like, you don't think about demographics. You don't think about mm -hmm. what it means to, to write for kids. You're just thinking about how your friends are going to react. <laughs> but uh, but so, so in a lot of ways, if I, if I knew that, that that comic that I did as Xerox to mini comics would eventually become a full color graphic novel and would actually be assigned in like classrooms, which just blows my mind, um, I, I worry. I, like, I think, would I have been, like, would I, would I have done some of the things that I did in, in that book? I, I do think that, um, that kids are a lot smarter than we give them credit for. You know, uh, I live with four kids. My wife and I have four kids. 
the youngest one is five and the oldest one is 13, almost 14. Just, just in, in our interactions, I can tell that they're smarter. Like a lot of times my wife and I will speak to each other and, and we'll talk about something that we think is very adult and we'll use as coded, you know, we'll try to code our language so that our kids don't understand. And the five-year-old will be like, what are you talking about? And we'll say, oh, it's, it's something adult. And then she'll tell us what we were talking about, <laughs> you know? So I, I think when you're, when you're writing for kids, you have to keep that in mind. You have to keep, keep in mind that they are much more sensitive to subtext than uh, people often give them credit for. Mm -hmm. Do you have an audience in mind when you're working most of the time? Now? Yeah. Now, you know, um, comics, at least historically, has not been as... Uh, we, have, we haven't been as rigid about age groups, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that was something that was very surprising to me after I signed with First Second. So First Second is a graphic novel imprint, but they live under Macmillan, which is one of the big publishers mm -hmm. uh, in the world. And in the book market, they really care about what age your, your book is for. And it's fairly finely grained, yeah, too. There's a, yeah, it's super finely grained. Yeah, it's, it's pretty pretty crazy it's pretty intense so I didn't I didn't really think about that mm -hmm. as a comic guy books uh, as a comic book guy I didn't really think about that um, but after I signed with first second they sort of stuck me under the YA banner and I do think that even though that wasn't something that I actively chose that I fit pretty well there mm -hmm. you know I think mm -hmm. the kind of things that concern me in my stories fits very well with that particular part of the, of the book market You've been mostly writing recently. I have. I've also been drawing, but I'm a very slow artist. It'll take like two years for this book that I'm drawing to come out. Oh, so yeah. do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, sure. Sure. I'm, I'm working on um, a, a, a book called Dragon Hoops. It'll be out from first second as soon as I'm done. <laughs> and it's my first nonfiction book. It's about a high school basketball team that I followed for the 2014-2015 season. I used to be a high school teacher. I used to teach computer science. I taught for 17 years. I only left about two years ago. So uh, during my last year at mm -hmm. that school, I, f I became friends with the coach of the varsity basketball team. I followed that team for a season. And uh, this book will be about that coach and his players. It's, uh, it's crazy. So you want me to, I'll tell you why I started doing this book, okay? Um, I started getting interested in basketball a little bit. I, I was never interested in basketball as a kid mostly because I sucked at it. I was terrible at it. It was always like this, every time I stepped on a court, uh, on a basketball court, it was like a, an occasion for humiliation, right? So I avoided basketball as much as possible. But then I got to know this coach, and he has this really crazy story. His name is Coach Lou, he's Lou Ritchie. He's an alum of the school. The school is called Bishop O'Dowd in Oakland, California. And when he was a student at that school, he was on the varsity basketball team, his junior year, Bishop O'Dowd made it to the state championship. So he, he was the point guard. Um, during the state championship game, they were down by one with seven seconds left in the game. They go out on the court. Lou gets the ball. 17-year-old Lou gets the ball. He puts it up. Uh, it goes through the hoop at the buzzer. So they win the game. Everybody freaks out. He hugs his coach. Everyone's screaming. And then the refs invalidate that call. The refs say mm -hmm. that the center on his team had his hand on the rim while the ball was up in its sacred cylinder. Um, and, uh, and they invalidate the call, they lose the game. Lou now is like 45 years old. He hands me a tape of the game and he says, you watch this game and you tell me if his hand was on that rim. And I gotta say, when you watch the replay, it's hard to tell. Even the announcers were talking about how hard it was to tell, right? So it haunted him since then. Uh, he eventually goes to play for UCLA, then he plays for Clemson, and then he gets injured, and that ends his playing career. He comes back as a coach, uh, and as an assistant coach, he started off as an assistant coach for his old head coach. As an assistant coach and then later a head coach, he's led five teams to the California State Championship, and he's lost all five times. <laughs> he lost all five times, right? So the, the season that I followed him, um, was supposedly his best chance at finally redeeming this thing that happened to him when he was 17 years old. Supposedly that was like the best team that O'Dowd had ever put together. The star of that team, his name is Ivan Rab. He just signed with the Grizzlies. I, I wanted to find out if he was going to actually 
get over that. Get over that old hurt. <laughs> Sounds fascinating. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I, I, I mean, I, I feel like uh, I still am no basketball expert, but following that team and, and, and researching for that book, I've definitely gained a, a much deeper appreciation for that sport and for its place in American culture. Mm-hmm. Are you going to keep writing your other series as well? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, so the other series that I'm doing is called Secret Coders. It's a project that I'm doing with Mike Holmes, who's upstairs. He's fantastically talented. You all should go check him out. He's along the back wall. Uh, before working with me, he did uh, the Bravest Warriors comics, and he also did the Adventure Time comics. Uh, Secret Coders is my first explicitly educational book. So Mike and I are trying to teach kids the fundamentals of computer science. I've taken a lot of what I used to do on my whiteboard as a computer science teacher and stuck them into, stuck all those lessons into a a graphic novel form. Uh, We originally signed to do three. The first books have done well enough that we've signed to do six. So it's a... Those six books are a complete beginning, middle, and end. Hmm. Um, I'm done with the scripting. Mike is working on the art for the sixth book. We're pretty happy with the way it turned out. The big secret of that book series is that the entire thing is actually a sequel to this classic, the science fiction classic that came out in the 1800s that is now in public domain. So a couple of the characters from that science fiction classic are characters in our book. Are you going to say what classic that is? No. That's the big reveal of, of book five. Ah, okay. And that's out next spring. <laughs> It'll be out, yeah. Book four will come out uh, in a month. Book five will be out next spring. Okay. That's right. And you're also doing work for DC Comics. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm doing work for DC Comics, which is crazy. It's <laughs> just crazy. I have to admit, when I was a kid, I was more of a Marvel guy uh, because I thought DC was stupid. Um, I remember finding out that there was a character named Aqualad at DC, and I was like, oh my gosh, how can you even take this universe seriously? Right? Aqua by itself was kind of dumb, but when you add Lad to it, that's just. I'm assuming you never read the Aqua Baby stories. No! (laughs) I didn't even know that was a thing. There was an Aqua Babies? Well, you know, Aquaman and Mera were married, and you have the whole. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Anyway. Marvel Marvel has like slapstick, which is ridiculous, but. Uh, but DC, I just could, I could not deal with it as a, as a kid. Now as an adult, in part because they, they give me paychecks, I have <laughs> developed a, an appreciation for, for the universe. But uh, a few years ago, um, this was one of the reasons I had to leave my teaching job. A few years ago, um, my agent called me up and, and they off- they said, she said, DC wants to know if you're interested in writing Superman. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then because, because um, you know, writing a, a monthly book like that is pretty demanding. Mm-hmm. There's no way I could I could keep teaching, so I had to leave my teaching job. But it's been fun. I, I did uh, I did a ten issue run on Superman. After that, I started having conversations with DC about what I might do next for them, and they were the ones that brought this idea up to me. They were like, "Gene, okay, don't get mad." They actually said this: <laughs> "Don't get mad." But what do you think about doing a Chinese Superman? I was like, that sounds terrible. I don't know why you do that. Like, why would you do that? That sounds terrible. But then, I, like, I, I, I flew down to um, their Burbank offices. I got to meet with Jim Lee, who's their co-publisher. Jim Lee made a name for himself in the '90s, uh, drawing X-Men and and the Punisher. Uh, I, I have boxes of Jim Lee comics in my house from when I was in high school. I'm a huge Jim Lee fanboy. He called me into his office. He told me that it was his idea to do like an, he wanted to add a, an Asian member of the Superman family, right? He told me it was his idea. I spent an hour staring at his face. He kept talking. <laughs> and afterwards I was like, all right, I guess we're doing this. So it's been super fun though. It's been great. Like, like I have to say, like my 10 issues of Superman, it was, it felt really like, it was fun too. But it felt like I was jumping in the deep end of a pool. Like, mm-hmm. I, like writing superhero comics is so different from doing graphic novels. You know, when I'm doing my graphic novels, if I get a note from my editor, it's kind of like a suggestion or like the beginning of a discussion. You know, oh, let's talk about this. Whereas when I get a note from my DC editor, it's it's not the beginning of a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I should say, to be fair, it's usually not the beginning of a discussion. It's usually something that I just have to I just have to do. But mm-hmm. um, but working on New Superman, it kind of feels like they gave me a, a little corner of their universe to, to play in, and it's been great. Good, good. I, 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 this is not quite the audience for that, but I do find it interesting when uh, established mainstream corporate publishers come for indie talent. It's always interesting to see how that relationship progresses. Yeah, yeah. I, so. I think there's a, a, a lot of us on this side of comics, the reason why we're on this side of comics is we're kind of control freaks. We like having 
control over the entire thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, especially with mini comics, you have control over even how the book is produced, and there's mm -hmm. something very satisfying about that. But that's something that you have to let go of if you go into superhero comics. So, so uh, switching topics, uh, I've noticed that uh, most of your books deal with religion. Some more yeah. explicitly than others, but yeah. even American-born Chinese has this monkey king folklore character, but above him in the hierarchy, there's a character can, that can be read as sort of the traditional god figure. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, so I would say, I would say the, two, two, the two biggest pieces that inform how I see my place in the world, that inform my identity, are my cultural heritage, me being a, a Chinese-American, an Asian-American, and also me uh, being Catholic. I'm, I'm Roman Catholic. I was raised Catholic. Uh, my mom converted after she came to the United States. And then, like most people who are part of some sort of faith tradition as an adult, um, I did go through a period. I, did, I should say, I did go through several periods. I continue to go through several periods where I, I wrestle with my faith and I wrestle with doubt. But, um, but I went through a, a period during my college years where I feel like that faith tradition went from something that I had gotten from my parents to something that was my own, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I think uh, a lot of the tension in my life comes, it comes from, I should say some, not a lot, some of the tension in my life, a good percentage of the tension in my life comes from the tension between my cultural heritage, between those two pieces, between my cultural heritage and this deeply Western faith tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it comes up. I feel like it just comes. It comes up. Like 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 I, I did a, a a minor in creative writing in college, uh, and I remember meeting with one of my professors. Her name was her name is Teresa Frank. She's a uh, she's a novelist, and um, and I went in and, and we had this long talk about religion and how it the relationship between religion and, and creative writing. You know. Um, I told her that I, I felt like uh, religion and faith was important to me, but I didn't, wasn't quite sure how to write about it. And, and she's, she, was a, she was a Buddhist, a practicing Buddhist of um, Romanian descent. And I was a Roman Catholic of Chinese descent. So I could just imagine our like, ancestors like freaking out, like flipping in their brains. <laughs> Anyways, so, so um, her advice to me essentially was that you should never write directly about faith. You should never write directly about religion. Um, what you should do is you should try to live your religion and then try to write your life. So that's, I, I've tried to take her advice to me. Part. That's how I try to, try to approach that particular topic. And yet your book, Level Up, which you wrote for another artist, uh -huh. has explicit angels in it. I mean, they, they come and tell the person, you know. Yeah, yeah, it does, it does. Level Up, Level Up has explicit angels in it, but they're not actually angels, right? They're actually um, characters from a video game. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, but it's true, it's true. Like, I, I actually think about that book a lot and whether I should have used angels. Because I didn't want to use angels in the, um, I, didn't want to, I didn't want them to be angels in like the, traditional Western religious sense, like in the Christian sense or, or the, uh, the Judeo-Christian sense. I wanted them to be um, Sanrio angels. So that's what I looked at as for my research with Sanrio. <laughs> you mean the makers of Hello Kitty? The makers of Hello, Hello Kitty. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Cool. Have you received any pushback about that? About religion? About, about portraying religion in your comics. Yeah, sure. But I, I don't know. I mean, I kind of think, like one of the, one of the big critiques I have, uh, I, I get from uh, for American-born Chinese, especially, you know, there's a there's there's a, a panel in that book where the words that are spoken by the deity figure are actually a paraphrase of a psalm from um, the Hebrew scriptures, um, and uh, and I have had like some of my Asian American friends have critiqued that book, saying, you know, the um, the Asian like the Christian Asian American experience is actually a colonized experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, I kind of think that's true. Like there's, there, there's, there's, I should say, there's an element of truth to that, right? There's an element of truth to that. And, um, and my hope is that, like my hope is that American War Chinese is not the only book that you read about, about Asian Americans or the Asian American experience, right? But I do think that like, um, 
like the Christian Asian American experience, Christianity has had um, such a strong impact on how Asian Americans have historically found a place in, in this country that it's just part of the conversation. I, I don't think you can get a complete picture of the Asian American experience without that being one voice. I don't think it can, I don't think it should be the only voice, but I do think it should be one voice mm -hmm. in, in, in the conversation. Mm -hmm. Are there other comics you recommend about the Asian American experience? Well, I think anything by Derek Kirk Kim is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So he's an atheist. He, he, I, I, he's one of my best friends and I think his work, at least on, on, the, um, on the topic of religion, I think it, it offers a good counterbalance to some of the stuff that I talk about. Uh, but his book, Same Difference, I mm -hmm. think is absolutely stellar. Uh, I, he, it doesn't, he doesn't deal with cultural, like he doesn't deal with cultural issues as explicitly as I do. But, um, and I think it's, it may be because he's a better writer. He does it in this really subtle way that I think is, is just very poetic and beautiful. But I think all of you ought to read Same Difference by Derek or Kim. Recently, I, I read a book by uh, T. Bui called The Best We Could Do. And I think it's one of the best graphic novels to have come out in, in the last year. That's also absolutely stellar. Uh, um, there, is that the one that's a memoir? It's a memoir. Yeah. It's a memoir. Uh, uh, I have another book. Um, so it isn't a, it's not about the Asian American experience, but it is about the clash between East and West. Um, it's uh, The Art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai by mm -hmm. uh, Sonny Liu. Mm -hmm. Sonny uh, is from Singapore. He, he grew up in Singapore. He still lives in Singapore. He came over to the United States for, uh, for his college work. He went to RISD. And, and, uh, and what he does in that book is he presents the history of Singapore uh, in comics form. The brilliant thing about his book is that for every decade he uses the form of comics that is dominant in that decade mm -hmm. to tell that portion. So when, when manga is dominant, he uses a manga format. When American newspaper comics are dominant, he uses American newspaper comics. It's, it's phenomenal. It's not, it's, I, I feel like that's tangentially related to Asian American experience, right? It's, it's about, it's about that, that intersection between East and West. Mm -hmm. cool. So we have a few minutes left. Um, we have a microphone in the center if anyone would care to ask questions. Don't be shy. <laughs> we answered everybody's questions. Awesome. <laughs> Over here. Thank you. I was wondering if you could comment more on bringing the journey west to audiences who may not have heard it before. Yeah, yeah. So um, a third of American born Chinese is about the Monkey King, which is not a character that I created. He's actually this old, old character. He and I go way back. My mom used to tell me Monkey King stories at bedtime when I was a kid. Almost any uh, Chinese kid has heard Monkey King stories uh, in, in China. He's a really big deal. There are like cartoons about him and live action movies about him. And he's this um, pretty flexible legendary character. So his story was first written down about 500 years ago. And um, depending on what China is going through, his story ends up getting repurposed, you know, mm. to, to sort of express the the concerns of the culture in, in any particular era. So in, in my book, um, I'm using him as a way of reflecting on the Asian American experience, or at least my Asian American experience, you know? And, and just, like, just like what I said about um, how American born Chinese portrays the Asian American experience in general, my hope is that the Monkey King in um, American born Chinese is not your only exposure to that character. That character is really deep um, and if you even get like three or four versions of that character, you'll have a much broader understanding of how he interacts with Eastern culture. So one version I'll give you, um, Dragon Ball Z mm -hmm. is loosely based on the Monkey King story. If you read a translation of Journey to the West and you watch those first early episodes of Dragon Ball Z, you'll see a one-to-one -one correspondence between all the major characters. That's why Goku has a tail. He's the Monkey King. But the version you draw is so cute. <laughs> Goku's pretty cute too. <laughs> 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 
Yes. Thank you so much for being here. I read American Born Chinese when I was in college. It helped me fall in love with graphic novels, so it's a real awesome. honor to be here um, and for you to be here. Uh, but my question is, you mentioned how we are in the middle of a comics renaissance and how we live in a night and day world compared to how the general public used to regard comics and how people regard the medium today. What further challenges do comic creators face as we move forward towards the future? So you're asking, okay, so asking what, what other challenges? Well, I, I mean, I don't think that challenge is over. You know, I, mm -hmm. I do think, even though I don't meet them, I do think there are people and there are pockets uh, of America where comics are not accepted as a literary form. And I also think that, like, we do not, we have way more genre diversity than we used to, but it is still not enough, you know? Mm -hmm. It is still not enough. Like, just, just in the, in the, in the, in the small category of comics about the Asian American experience, um, the fact that I run out after I run out of fingers is, is I think, a problem. I think, I think there should be so many in any subgenre, subcategory of graphic novels that you, you just, you keep listing and listing and listing. Uh, a few um, categories of comics where I really want to see growth, number one is uh, explicitly educational comics. If you visit Korea or Japan, uh, you go to a, a bookstore, not a comic book store, store but uh, any, any bookstore, they're going to have at least one full shelf of explicitly educational comics. I want that for America too. And second is nonfiction comics. You know, there's some great nonfiction comics out there now, especially memoir, but I would love to see a whole shelf of nonfiction comics. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And if I can chime in, nonfiction yeah. comics that use the comic format. You can find a lot of books that people have jumped on the bandwagon and it's basically illustrated text. But people who use the format to its full extent, um, there's still some, some way to go yeah. Yeah. in the mass market publishing industry, yes. I think. Yes, so. yes. And also, also like, um, like I would say in terms of, in terms of um, um, the diversity of creators, in terms of representation for creators. If you go to a show like this and you, and, and, and you, and you look at what's happening, it's, it's really amazing to see, mm -hmm. right? But a lot of that has not yet been translated into, um, into formats that, that um, get wider distribution. And I would mm -hmm. like to see that. I would like mm -hmm. to see more um, creators who, who, uh, who come to shows like this. To, to get wider distribution than they have now. Mm -hmm. Well, and there's people making comics, and then there's people who are able to make a living making comics. Yes, yes. So that's still, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities now we didn't have half a decade ago, yeah. Kickstarter, Patreon, web comics, but um, it's still a lot of a struggle, it I think, a for struggle. a lot of people, especially yeah. um, the non-traditional voices. Yes, so. it is still a ramen discipline. Right? <laughs> you have to eat a lot of ramen, just to do it. So. My favorite well, book by you is the Boxers and Saints books. And I was wondering like, where you got the inspiration to do like, a parallel of the two stories. And like, I know it's like, a little bit complicated to depict Chinese history. Like, where did you, like, how did you handle that? Basically, what was your thinking? Well, first, thank you for reading Boxers and Saints. That is definitely the hardest book that I've done so far, I, you know, from, a, from a creative standpoint. Uh, so the Boxers, Boxers and Saints is a two-volume graphic novel about the Boxer Rebellion, a war that was fought on Chinese soil in the year 1900. I first got interested in the Boxer Rebellion in the year 2000. Like I said, I grew up in a, in a, in a Catholic community. I grew up in a Chinese Catholic community. And in the year 2000, the Catholic Church canonized a group of Chinese Catholic saints. So canonization is a process that the Catholic Church uses to honor the lives of certain members, you know. Um, and, uh, and the church that I grew up in, my home church, freaked out about it because this is the first time that the Catholic Church had honored Chinese citizens in this way. When I looked into the lives of these newly canonized saints, I discovered that many of them had been martyred during the Boxer Rebellion. They were killed specifically because back then, <coughs> if, you were, uh, if you were Chinese and you embraced any form of Western faith, you know, any form of Christianity, you were seen as a traitor to your, your culture. And the more I read about that, the more I felt like the Box Rebellion, the central tension of Box Rebellion was one that I still saw in the world today, that I still saw in my own life. You know? So I started, I started reading about the Box Rebellion in general. Uh, I read about the Boxers. The Boxers were these um, young kids who 
were, they were mostly the children of farmers who lived in the farmlands of China. China had gone through a really bad century. The 1800s were just terrible for the country. So they had gone through droughts and wars and, and, these, and these teenagers um, basically had no future, right? Their, their farms were all dead and um, the Europeans and the Japanese had come into their country. They had established essentially colonies, little, little colonies in all the major cities. These, these kids were angry about it. They were angry about this foreign presence in their homeland. They were angry about this helplessness that they saw in their country. So they came up with this really crazy thing. They came up with this religious ritual that they believed when they performed it, they would be able to call the Chinese gods down from the skies, right? And these Chinese gods would possess them and give them superpowers. And as a comic book nerd, I read about that and I was like, that is ancient Chinese Shazam. That is like a, that is a, you know, that's a dynamic that I'm very familiar with. So, so that interested me on one side. The reason why it was two volumes was because I could not decide whether the boxers were heroes or villains. I read one book and I feel like they're definitely heroes. And I read another one where I'm like, no, they're kind of villains. So I, I felt like I had to do a book that presented both sides. Thank you. And on that note, I think we'll need to wrap up at this point. Our thanks yes, coming and thank talking you. to us. Thank you all for coming. So.